It's half past eight. It's half past eight, New York time. Time to wake up America and stop the experts. Each week at this time, Lucky Strike stages a quiz party with four experts providing the floor show. For every question we use, Lucky Strike pays out $10 plus a copy of the new Information Please quiz book. If your question stumps us, you get $25 more plus a 24-volume set of the current Encyclopedia Britannica. Send your questions to Information Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. If our editorial staff edits your questions a bit, don't fret over it. In case of duplication, Information Please uses the question that was received first. And all questions become the property of Information Please. And now light up a lucky strike as I present our master of ceremonies, the literary critic of the New Yorker magazine, Clifton Fadiman. Mr. Fadiman. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, Information Please is a completely unrehearsed and spontaneous performance. And tonight, the performers include Franklin P. Adams of the New York Post's Cunning Tower, John Kieran, Sports Authority and General Fount of Wisdom, Louis E. Laws, famed as Warden of Sing Sing and author of Meet the Murderer, who has been with us before. I mean the warden. And uh, doing his best to scare up a little information for us this evening, Mr. Boris Karloff, now appearing in the Broadway hit Arsenic and Old Lace. We have placed the warden and Mr. Karloff side by side. <laughs> now remember, listeners, for each question that's missed, Lucky Strike rings up $25. And that's paid out to the sender, plus 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And before we start the more formal part of the program, Mr. Karloff, would you have any objection to my asking you a question? This won't count for money. No. Uh, you're now appearing and <coughs> scaring people wholesale in arsenic and old lace, are you not? That's true. Very good. Well, so far, you have made a perfect response. <laughs> now, Mr. Karloff, how many murders are supposed to have been committed by you and the old ladies, maybe I better say by the old ladies and you, politeness first, uh, in arsenic and old lace. How many murders in all? Well, this is for Mr. Karloff, Mr. Adams. It'll be 26 by the time the final curtain comes down. 26? Now, I have it on good authority that it's only 25. 25. How do you make it, Mr. Adams? It's 12 all, and the tie is broken when the uh, 25th or uh, the 13th boy comes in. Yes. I beg to differ. 12 all is a very disputed point. I claim That is 13. also known as deuce. <laughs> now, I, I'd, like to get, I'd like to get this straight, Mr. Karloff. Uh, I mean, what's a murder between friends, but still... I have a perfect tally of 13. The old ladies have 12, and at the end of the play, they get Mr. Witherspoon, which makes 13 for them. It's a tie still, but makes a grand total of 26. Is that right? Well, I, I, think so. I, I have it as 25. I'm going to go down next Wednesday and see which is right. I'd like Good. the old ladies to come out ahead, though. <laughs> All right. Now, here's a question from Mrs. P.F. Wilson of Utica, New York. A very unsanguinary question. If you received an invitation to dinner from the following Mother Goose characters, what would you be most likely to eat? Now, we have to get two out of three. Suppose you received an invitation from Taffy the Welshman. What would you have for dinner at his home? Uh, Mr. Karloff. You get a side of beef and a marrow bone. How do you make out the marrow bone? Uh, because... When the man who was robbed of the side of beef, when he went back to Taffy's... When he went back to his home, he was out, and he had a marrow bone, yeah. and he hit Taffy on the head with it. Why, <laughs> Mr. Karloff, your, your accuracy terrifies me. It really does. I, I was just going to say a side of beef, but the marrow bone is certainly correct. I think that comes in the last verse. Very good. Should we should we have him with us again, Mr. Adams, to Kieran, Warden Lloyd? Sounds good. very good. good. All right. Now, suppose you went to the home of uh, little Tom Tucker, Mr. Tucker Jr. What would you have to eat there, Mr. Kieran? They could go hungry. He sings for his supper. Uh, well, how about going on with a poem a little, and you'll see that he may get White something. bread and butter. Yes. What shall he eat? White bread and butter. He sings, but he gets something for singing, which is much more than we can say to Mr. Adams. Uh, in the case of the three little kittens, in the three little kittens, if you were invited there, Mr. Kieran. Pie. Uh, yes, short and sweet. If you pie. found your mittens. Yes, and you may have some pie. That's right. That gives us three out of three. Thank you. Now, the next question comes from Albert Miller of New York City. Can you name three men, gentlemen, who appeared before the House Foreign Affairs Committee to testify in favor of the lease-lend bill and three who testified against the lease lend bill. Now, you may get together on this. Uh, Warden Laws, will you start us off? Well, in favor of the bill were the Secretary Hull, Secretary of the Navy Knox, Secretary of War Stimson, 
That's three. That's three. That's very good. That's perfect. Against there uh, was uh, Colonel Lindbergh. Correct. And uh, the socialist, Mr. Thomas. Correct. And the uh, uh, General Johnson. General Johnson. You do read the papers down at Sing Sing, don't That's you? That's all we that? do. That's very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, very well answered. Thank you very much. Now, the next one will be in the nature of uh, oh, a few little playlets. El Madden of Hollywood, California, dreamed this one up. We have uh, an actor and an actress here, and they're going to give you some bits of dialogue. Name the play in which each of these bits of dialogue occurred. Let's have the first. No, I won't. Even though you do hate me, you're still my wife. Who were you till I married you? Nobody. What were you? A telephone girl getting $10 a week. And now who are you? You're Mrs. Robert Stafford. And what are you? You're the wife of one of the richest men in the country. And how did he get his wife? He bought you and he paid for you. Robert Stafford, you didn't. Goodness gracious. Uh, uh, Mr. Carlisle. That'd be bought and paid for. Bought and paid for. That's very good. Very good. Now, shall we have the second bit of dialogue? Go ahead. Father. found you at last. Now, won't you come home with me? Blessings on thee, my little one. Darkly shadowed is the sky that hangs gloomily over thy young head. Come, father. Mother has been waiting a long time, and I left her crying so sadly. Now, do come home and make us all so happy. Yes, my child, I'll go. You have robbed me of my last penny, Simon Slade, but this treasure still remains. Farewell, friend Slade. Come, dear one. Come. I'll go home. I'd like to inform the audience that Mr. Adams has broken down completely. <laughs> uh, Mr. Carlock. That's Joe Morgan and his daughter Mary in Ten Nights in a Bar Room. That's very good, Mr. Carlock. Very good indeed. <laughs> you certainly have been in some odd places. Oh, we're going to have one more. If you can give us a perfect score, Mr. Karloff, we'll be very much surprised and gratified. Let's have so a will I. <laughs> Go ahead. Isabel, they are as dear to me as you once were. As I once was, and might have been now. Oh, Archibald, I am now on the very threshold of the other world. Will you not say one word of love to me before I pass it? Let what I am be blotted for the moment from your memory. Will you not... Bless me. Only a word of love. My heart is breaking for it. You nearly broke mine when you left me, Isabel. May he so deal with you as I fully and freely forgive you. May he bless you and take you to his rest in heaven. Farewell, my once dear husband. Until eternity. Until eternity. Gosh, now Karloff is broken down. <laughs> uh, Mr. Karloff, you had your hand up. That's the death of Lady Isabel in East Lynn. I wonder how you can say it through your tears, Mr. Karloff. <laughs> <laughs> That's three out of three for Mr. Boris Karloff, and brilliant going. <laughs> they run pretty far back, don't they, Mr. Karloff? Hundreds of years, so far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> the next question from Robert N. Blewett of Stockton, California. Now, listen carefully. A young crime reporter sent the following statement in to his editor, and he was corrected on several counts. Enumerate three of his errors. It's a very short statement. Quote, Sent to state prison for two years for disorderly conduct, John Doe was released on probation after serving half his sentence. There are three errors in the reporter's statement. Uh, Warden, do you want to start us off? Yes. Uh, in the first place, you can't send a man to state prison for disorderly conduct. It's a misdemeanor and not a felony. Good enough. And secondly, it's probation. Probation is incorrect. It would be parole. And uh, it's incorrect to, to say one half the time, but that is probably not what you mean there. No. Uh, no, uh, perhaps you're, you're mistaken. Sir, uh, he was released on probation after serving half his sentence. You mean that couldn't be possible? Not if he were on probation. Uh, that wasn't the error I was after, though. Can you think of a third? You've got two of them, Warden Laws. Sent to state prison for two years for disorderly conduct. <coughs> uh, John Doe is released on probation after serving half his sentence. Uh, we have to get the third. Now, the third error 
is that disorderly conduct is punishable by not more than a year. And in most states... Well, I uh, said six it was a misdemeanor at first. I said it was for a felony and not a misdemeanor. And you assumed I knew... misdemeanor means a, a year. Oh, well, how should I know that? I've lived a clean <laughs> life, uh, Warden. I assumed I... after reading the Saturday Evening Post that you knew everything. Oh, I paid for that. <laughs> uh, three out of three, then, for Warden Laws, and thank you very much. Uh, Joseph C. Flood of Malvern, Long Island, sends this one in. I'm going to ask you to quote for me three poems. Adams, not songs, poems. <laughs> Uh, three poems beginning, it was. Have to begin with the two words, it was. Uh, Mr. Adams had his hand up first. It was a summer evening. Old Casper's work was done. That's a good one. It's from what poem? The Battle of Blenheim by Robert Southey. Very good. Uh, Mr. Carloff had his hand up second. It was the schooner Hespers that sailed the wintry sea, and I don't know who wrote it. <laughs> Mr. Carloff, apparently you were once a child. It's very hard to, uh, to uh, realize, looking at you now. Longfellow. <laughs> Longfellow. Longfellow, yes. That gives us two it wases. How about a third it was? Mr. Kieran, your hand was up. Why, he took the schooner Hespers right out from under me. <laughs> well, Karloff is a thief as well as a murderer. How about another it was? Well, I can think of one from uh, Lewis Carroll. Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves did something in... Twas. Yes, but that's approximately the same thing. Uh, how about another one, gentlemen? We have to get three. Well, how about uh, your favorite poem, Mr. Kieran? It was many and many a year ago by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. Uh, I'll think Edgar of Allen a dozen Poe. later. Uh, <laughs> that, I think, sends $25, courtesy of Lucky Strike, to Mr. Flood, plus a set of Lee Britannica. Now, the next question comes from Mrs. M. W. Self of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Get two out of three if you can. This is right up your alley, uh, Mr. Karloff, and also to some extent up yours, Warden. Who killed the following people? <laughs> Who killed Jesse James? Who killed Jesse James? Now, we have one, two, three hands. I think the Warden had his hand up first. We have four hands up. Who killed the Warden? Killed by one of his followers. In fact, two of them shot him in the back, and the name was uh, one of his own men. So I, I'm, I'm sure you know him if you saw him, but we have to have the exact name. I know, I'm thinking. Uh, Mr. Carlos. I think his name was Ford. Yes, it was. That's right. Robert Ford, that's right. Dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard. That's right, that's right. Thank you, Mr. Adams. You apparently are interested in the history of your profession, Mr. Carlos, as uh, well as just acting it out. How about who killed Lenny? Who killed Lenny? I won't tell you who Lenny was. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, the other man in of mice and men. Yes, but you got to give me his name. That's right, Mr. Adams. It was the other man in of mice and men. And his name? I'm sorry. We have to get it exactly. It was George. George and of mice and men. You have to have a pretty good memory to remember that, I think. Now the third. Who killed Queen Gertrude? Queen Gertrude. Who is Queen Gertrude? Mr. Kieran. I think, uh, she drank poison. Uh, yes. Who, who is she? Where uh, do you meet her? She's, uh, Mrs. Uh, Hamlet Sr. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, this is an intimate program, Mr. Kieran. Now, you don't have she to She was so the strong. mother of Hamlet. She was the, the wife of Hamlet. of Hamlet, the late Hamlet, deceased. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, no doubt the king put poison in the drink, and she drank it by mistake. Yes. Who would be guilty of the murder in that case? Uh, well, the king was certainly an accessory before the fact. Well, I, I, <laughs> that's right, Mr. Kieran. He would be guilty of murder even if he got the wrong victim. Mr. Carlop, don't let this conversation put any ideas in your head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, so far, Lucky Strike has paid out $25 and one set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And now Mr. Milton Cross, of all people, wants to de-glamorize that weird chant of the tobacco auctioneer. Not at all, Mr. Fadiman. I simply want to point out that in spite of the color and excitement of the auctions, tobacco sales are, after all, a dollars and cents proposition. That's why it means so much that Lucky Strike consistently pays more, much more than average market prices, to get the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder leaf. For example, final reports for the season from Abingdon, Virginia, show that at the auctions there, the American Tobacco Company paid 36% more per pound for the tobacco it bought for its cigarettes and 6% above the average market price paid for all the various types and grades of tobacco sold there. And the best we bought will go to Lucky's. Now, this is typical of reports from market after market, year after year. 
We want and pay for and get that finer, lighter, milder leaf. Try Lucky's for a week and see for yourself. Mr. Cross, you made your point in just 57 seconds. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the second half of the program, may we remind you that the annual campaign against infantile paralysis is now underway in your community. Support it, give all the dimes you can, and help make every town and city in the nation a front line of America's national defense against infantile paralysis. Remember, every dime helps protect the health of the youngster just around your corner. And now we'll go on with the second half of the program with a question coming to us from Alvin P. Hosenberg of South River, New Jersey. Distinguished gentlemen, among robbery, burglary, and larceny. I know these crimes are beneath your notice, Mr. Carlock. Mr. Kieran, would you start us off? Robbery? Yes. You rob a man. You burglarize a house. Why you? Uh, This all... Uh, (laughs) And you... uh... One, one, one. What? One robs a house. One robs a house. (laughs) One robs a man. Two burglarize a house. (laughs) That's right. And, uh, well, larceny is uh, theft uh, uh, of a rather, on a rather wide scale. Uh, well, just just uh, removal of any personal property with intent to deprive rightful owner of possession. It yes, but I mean, so... you don't have to do it in a house, and you don't have to take it off a man on the street. No, no, you can do it in an airplane, anywhere at all. <laughs> uh, those are, that's approximately the distinction. Do you want to make it any clearer for us, Warden Laws? You probably know more about thing, these things even than Mr. Oh, Kieran. well, robbery, of course, is always a threat against with violence. Yes, robbery. He, that's right. The gentleman missed that. He did miss the but threat. But he assumed it, of course... Excuse me if I'm not right with Karloff punching me on the left and this fellow on the right. <laughs> You're darn glad you haven't got a stiletto on your side by this time. I may have. <laughs> but that is the only distinction. I think otherwise he did very yeah, well. Yeah, he did very well indeed. Thank you, Mr. Kieran, and thank you, Warden Laws. They'll all get you in trouble, won't they, Warden? <laughs> <laughs> they give me a job. <laughs> uh, Edmund Ferguson of Westfield, New Jersey, sends this one in. Uh, this is all about ships. Who, in the absence of orders, to get two out of three, gentlemen, who, in the absence of orders, remained on a ship which was in serious danger? Mr. Carlyle. The boy stood on the burning deck. Very good. You've had a variegated career, Mr. Carlyle. Very. You're coming through on the oddest questions. <laughs> the boy stood on the burning deck. He, he wouldn't go, uh, he wouldn't, uh, wasn't able to hear us, Father? The burning deck went so that him. him had fled. That's right. The flames rolled on. He would not go without his father's word. Do you remember that? That father, faint in death below, his voice no longer heard. Remember that, Mr. Carla? No, I yeah. don't. <laughs> uh, who left a threatened ship too soon? Who left a threatened ship too soon? Mr. Carla, our naval expert. Was Lord Jim in Joseph Conrad's Indeed, book? Indeed it was, Mr. Carla, and I think that's very good going. That's exactly what the novel I think turns so about. Too, is Very it? <laughs> Are you uh, surprised at yourself, Mr. Carla? Uh, amazed. <laughs> you know, I really expected you to be terrified. At, uh... I am. <laughs> well, one would never suspect. Well, it. you don't know your own strengths, boy. <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you say to that man, Adams. Uh, whose ship, gentlemen, rested on a mountain peak? Mr. Kieran. Noah. Noah. Yes, uh, Mr. Carla and Mr. Adams had their hands up too, and I think they probably would have said the same thing. Warden, uh, did you know? I had my hand up. You saw three of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, Gives you and, three out of four. And on what mountain, then, Warden Laws? On what mountain did the ship rest? Well, you say Ararat, was it somewhere? Ararat, around? that's exactly right. You did know after all. Uh, Mrs. C.E. Wilkinson. <laughs> Mrs. C.E. Wilkinson of Oakland, New Jersey, sends this one in. Get two out of three. Give the family name at birth of each of these royal ladies. The first is Mary, Queen of Scots, her family name. Uh, Mr. Kieran. Stuart. Stuart is right. The 16th century Queen Elizabeth of England. Her uh, family name. Uh, Mr. Kieran again? I think she was a Tudor. She was indeed. Uh, Elizabeth Tudor. And the present Queen Elizabeth of England? That's a little harder. Is it Uh, Douglas? No, it is not. I didn't think so. No, no. (laughs) Uh, Bose Lyon. It's a, a hyphenated name, Bose Lyon. Elizabeth Bose Lyon, the family name of the present Queen of England. That gives us two out of three, however, and sends us on to a question from Mr. James M. Sinclair of Brooklyn. 
Name three books, gentlemen, which mention vices or human weaknesses in their titles. That gives us a large field. Uh, Mr. Adams, punishment. Which of them is the vice and which the uh, weakness? I uh, think crime is the uh, vice. Crime is the vice, yes. And uh, punishment uh, may a, or may not be the weakness. It's just the job for, for the warden. Crime and punishment, very good, by Dostoevsky. Mr. Karloff. Uh, I think a book named Drink by Zola. Emil Zola. It's rather puritanical of you. Uh, How? You think drink is a, is a human weakness? Not altogether. Why, it's some people's strength. Uh, I'll accept drink by Zola. Thank Very good. Uh, any others? Well, think of some human frailties. Uh, Warden Mental Laws, you're an expert in this. by beers. A big one. pardon? Mental deficiency by mm -hmm. beers. That's the uh, B-W-E-R-S. Yes. And it's uh, a very fine book. All right, I'll uh, take mental deficiency. Uh, I'll split it with you, You got Kieran. it right ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kieran? Alibaba and the Forty Thieves. Oh, yes, that's a good one. Uh, thieves, thievery. Uh, James Thompson wrote a poem called The Cats, which is a human frailty. Uh, the Miser by Moliere. Uh, the Misanthrope, also by Moliere. Can you think of any others? Hours of Idleness, a poem by whom, Mr. Kieran? Byron. Byron. Idleness. Well, there are three. We could perhaps get many more. Joan Stone of New York City sends this one in. This is all about numbers. These numbers have been mentioned in the news very recently. Identify them. The first is 26 years. 26 years. What does that mean to any of you? No, Warden, it is not a sentence. No, it's too... I don't know. It seems like yesterday. <laughs> well, it's the number of years that Justice McReynolds has been on the bench of the Supreme Court. Uh, just a day or two ago, the justice sent in his resignation to the president, as you know, after a long and honorable term of service of 26 years. That's one wrong. Now, how about 59 years? 59 years, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, the president will be uh, 59 years old this uh, What uh, day? Jan 30. That's right. And <laughs> Jan 30, and don't forget the March of Dimes, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Fifty-nine years uh, will be President Roosevelt's age. Uh, how about four million? Four million. Does that mean anything to you, uh, Mr. Carlock? That's the number of men under arms in England at the moment yes. in the Empire. Yes, uh, waiting to repel uh, any possible invasion. That gives us three. No, it gives us two out of three, which is all we were required to get. Now, how about this one? It's a very simple question from Lewis M. Moss of this city. Which of these elements is most difficult to find free? in nature. Gold, platinum, iron. Is the question clear? Because gold is the most difficult to find free under any circumstances, but th they mean chemically free. Uh, Mr. Kieran? I think iron. Uh, why would you say that? That's well, because correct, generally Kieran. found is Fe203. That means uh, a lot to me. Which is a common iron ore. Gold is certainly found uh, pure and free in, uh, in nature, and I think... Uh, uh, platinum, maybe. I'm not sure about I'm that. not sure either. The point about iron uh, is that it's very active chemically and has a tendency to combine with many other elements. That's right, Mr. Kieran. Thank you. Now, how about this one? From Walter P. Carr of Philadelphia. Uh, get two out of three if you can. What was the name of the following characters? The first is Charlie's Aunt. Charlie's Aunt, of course, is a well-known farce which is now running in New York. Uh, Charlie's Aunt had a name. Mr. Carlos. I think it was Lord Fancourt Babberley. I think you're thinking of the... Oh. Of the... Uh, yeah. Of the... Uh, I'm thinking of the fictitious Charlie's yes, aunt. Yes, that is, of the one who disguised himself as Charlie's aunt. But the aunt's name the herself... name is Donna Lucia d'Alvadori. Very good, Mr. Carl. I forbear to ask you whether this comes out of your recent memory or, or out of the memory of long ago. Had long, long ago. Long, long ago. What an interesting thing the inside of your mind must be, Mr. Carl. Extraordinary. The, uh, the lost lady. What was her name? Who was she? Uh, Mr. Adams. Well, she is the heroine of, uh, Willa Cather's book. That's quite right. Uh, Willa Cather's, uh, novelette, or short novel. Don't know her name? Don't know her read. name. Uh, any of you remember? Marion Forrester. Marion Forrester. That's a rather hard one to remember. Now, the third is the Vagabond King. What was his name? The Vagabond King, Mr. Adams. Uh, F. Villon. F. Villon, that's right. And uh, his full name? Francois. Francois. 
<laughs> That's right. Francois Villon, the uh, hero of the musical comedy, Vagabond King. That gives us two out of three. Now, how about this one? Mr. Karloff and the warden, we're back on crime again. Uh, Mrs. A. Silbert of Jamaica sends this one in. What real crime... Uh, describe the real crime on which the following books were or appear to have been based. The first is The Lodger by Mrs. Belloc Lowndes. You know the real murders on which those were based? Um, warden Laws? No. Mr. Karloff? It might have been Jack the... How about Free Roger by Poe? Uh, Mr. Kieran? Well, there's a girl by the name of Rogers. You're right. And how about the Benson murder case by S.S. Van Dyne? Uh, that doesn't awaken any response, uh, even in the professional what? eye of Mr. Karloff. Was that the uh, murder of the bridge uh, player? That's right, Mr. Kieran. What's his name? Oh, uh, I can't think of it all. Well, I think that's good enough. Joseph P. Elwell, and that's that gives right. us three yeah. out of three. I think that's very good. And now here's Mr. Cross in a reminiscent mood. Those tobacco market reports we brought you a few minutes ago from Abingdon, Virginia, made me recall a little tobacco lesson I got one day from the Lucky Strike tobacco buyer at another Virginia auction. We were standing on the auction floor beside two baskets of leaf. One basket had just been sold American at $31 a hundred pounds. The other basket had gone to another buyer at $22 a hundred pounds, nine dollars less. So I asked the buyer, what makes this tobacco worth more? He answered, a made difference in quality and real mildness those few dollars make. This tobacco for Lucky Strike is finer, lighter, and milder, so of course it costs more. Well, I've often thought that little tobacco lesson should be learned by more smokers. Remember, we pay the price to get the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos. So next time, why not ask for Lucky Strike? Thank you, Mr. Cross. Now, tonight, Lucky Strike has paid out the rather small sum of $25 and only one set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Thank you, Warden Laws, and thank you, Mr. Boris Karloff, for coming to Lucky Strike's party tonight. Next week, Mr. Kieran and Mr. Adams will be on hand, and as our guests, we present the celebrated author, critic, and actor, Mr. Alexander Wilcott, and Mr. S.J. Perlman, a familiar contributor to the New Yorker magazine and the author of the recent humorous book, Look who's talking. Remember, listeners, for every question we use, whether or not it's answered correctly, the sender gets the sum of $10. If the question should happen to stump our experts, you not only get $25 more, but in addition, the complete 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember to send your letters with questions and the correct answers to Information, Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. And now, a parting message from Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs, famous tobacco auctioneer of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And that chant, fully interpreted, ladies and gentlemen, means luckies pay higher prices for the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder tobaccos. With independent tobacco experts, auctioneers, buyers, warehousemen, with men who know tobacco best... It's Lucky's two to one. This is the National Broadcasting Company.